You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. This is season three. It's episode 30. Cubs let the series slip in San Diego. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram, and Fly the W on Facebook. Of course, you can email Crowley and I, fly the W670 at gmail.com. Crowley, uh, happy off day to you. We're uh, looking at our wounds a little bit after things went uh, not so hot last night in San Diego. Well, you know, Dustin, I think both you and I, when we were looking at the series, uh, we said one and three is what we kind of figured it would be. But after what happened on Monday night, it just wasn't good enough. It, it, it couldn't happen. And that and that's really where it, it really stings. If they would have won last night, the stink of Friday could have gotten washed off, but they didn't. And now you lost a series. Yeah, it was disappointing. Um, I am glad, though, they were able to get that uh, that second game. That was a good uh, that was a good bounce back. But uh Uh, We'll get to uh, Kyle Hendricks outing in a couple of minutes. But first, let's get to game one. That was Javier Assad and you, Darvish. Uh, Not exactly the pitching matchup that uh, uh, we were thinking was going to be good for the Cubs offense, but uh, Cubs bats got to him pretty quick. Yeah, on paper, it didn't look good, Darvish versus uh, Assad. But, you know, the Cubs continued to swing hot bats with two outs. Darvish loaded the bases and Ian Happ single to put the Cubs ahead 2-0. Darvish then walks Saya to load the bases again, and Cody Bellinger doubled, and the Cubs were up 4 nothing after two. In that second inning, Dustin, Cubs hitters made Darvish throw 42 pitches in the inning. He finished the third, but his day was done. He gave up four runs, three walks, and three innings of works. He threw 65 pitches. Dustin, we talked about how the Cubs really struggled against Darvish. Not that night. Not that night. That was great. Uh, Really, really loving overall the approach these guys are taking to the plate. It's been fantastic. Right. And then not only that, the Cubs beat on his replacement, Pedro Avila, in the fourth. They load the bases with one out. Cody Bellinger hit a sack fly to make it 5 nothing. Christopher Morrell followed that up with a double to make it 6 nothing, And then Dansby tripled to score two more runs. Cubs are up 8 nothing, and I think half the Chicagoland area turned off the TV, able to go to bed knowing safe and sound that this was going to be a victory. Not to be, but uh, not so fast, my friend. <laughs> yeah, right. Javier <laughs> Assad was cruising. He struck out two batters in the first, in the second, with runners at first and third and one out. He struck out two more batters. He didn't give up a hit in the third, fourth, fifth inning. So, you know, no doubt Craig Council is going to let him go out in the six. Uh, he walks to Tease Jr., which you can't do up eight nothing. Put it down the middle. I don't care. Um, but then he gives up a two-run homer to Jake Cronworth. That made it eight to two. Assad's night was done, but he, you know, he went five innings pitch. He gave up two runs, three uh, hits, three walks, and seven Ks. You got to cut the walks down. Uh, again, that that cost you a run there, but that was another good start for Assad. You'll take that any day of the week. Yeah, other than the walks, Crowley, I would take that outing any day of the week, no doubt about it. Now, Council decided to call on Jose Quas, which I didn't have a problem with. It was a low leverage situation. You're up eight two. The very first base batter he faces, Manny Machado reaches on a fielding error by Dansby Swanson, his second of the season. That should have been out number one. He then gave up a single to Jerks and Profar to put runners at first and third. Then ha Sung Kim hits one to right, and Mike Talkman tried to cut it off, went under the glove, two runs are going to score, and Kim is on third, and the Cubs' lead is 8-4. to four. Uh, Luis Camposano grounded out to make it eight to five council pulls Quas after he gave up a six, uh, single to Jackson Merrill. And he calls on Luke little, who's been doing really well. The first batter he faced, he got to strike out, but then he gave up a two run Homer to Xander Bogarts and the Cubs eight, nothing lead was cut to eight to seven. So Dustin, I mean, a couple bad defensive plays, walks, stuff like that. They're just going to hurt you. Walks and defensive errors will kill you every single time. As much as I wasn't happy with what uh, Quas was throwing out there, um, you know, his defense didn't help him out at all. Now, it might not have been, you know, eight to seven by the time we got out of that inning, but it could have easily been eight to five because of the, the walks and the shoddy defense. Now, Little struggled with control in the seventh, walking two of the first three batters he faced, but Hector Neris was able to get out of the jam. Neris comes back in the eighth, walks the first batter he faces, gets an out, and in comes closer Edward Alzali for a five-out save. He strikes out Xander Bogarts, but then leaves one middle-middle spinning for Fernando Tatis, who blasts a two-run homer to put the Padres up nine to eight, and that is how the game would end. Like, you know, Dustin, I mean, this one's clearly on the pen. Quas, Little, Neris, Alzlai went three innings. They gave up seven runs on five hits, three walks, 
two home runs and only two strikeouts. Uh, Quas has an ERA of nine, Neris, you know, over seven. And that was the second blown save for Alzali. So, you know, you, you look at that game and, and, and again, the defense didn't help, but even with the defense, man, the, the bullpen has got to be better than that. And our guy, Chris Kompka from uh, Marquee Sports, he had the tweet of the night. Cubs had won 43 state games when scoring eight plus runs until last night. They were 32 and 0 last season when scoring at least eight runs. I mean, just unbelievable. Yeah, very hard to stomach a game when you score eight runs. When you score eight runs, you should basically win every time, which is what the Cubs did um, last year. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was worried about the first game. I was worried that they were going to be tired. The, the, the Sunday game went long because of the rain delays, and they got to fly basically, you know, three quarters of the country to get out to San Diego. Um, and they were facing you, Darvish. But when you get to him, I mean, the bullpen should not have been as exhausted as it was. But my only problem is when you have the opportunity to win that game, you know, you know, was a Mark Leiter Jr. event? Were, were some other guys available instead of instead of going to Jose Quas? You know, it's the old Crowley when you have the, your, your foot on their throat, you've got to finish it. OK, and like. He brings in Quas because I think he thought it would be easy for him, right? Uh, as you mentioned, not a high leverage situation. I think when you when you do that, you potentially bring the entire team's level down a bit. Okay, and maybe that's why Dansby Swanson made the error that he made. Maybe that's why Mike Talkman had the, uh, the you know the the not great play he had because everybody was just kind of like, well, we'll just keep going. Well, we'll just get through it. No, damn it, let's put the throat foot on the throat and end this night. Uh, again, you know. Uh... When you talk about counsel, he talks about playing the long game, and I had no problem with Quas. You know, those guys, I don't care what they think. They need to be ready to play defense. That That's the mark of this team, so that was disappointing. All right, let's get to uh, game number two. We had the major league debut of Ben Brown. The first start for Ben Brown. First start for Ben Brown. So, and so, The first major league start for Ben Brown. Yeah, after Monday night's disaster, the Cubs needed to bounce back in game two. And Dustin, I think that's why they didn't put in like, I think, you know, Ben Brown's not completely stretched out yet. And so I think that's why they were kind of holding off um, a little bit when you talk about Drew Smiley. Uh, they needed to bounce back and they gave the ball to Ben Brown, the number nine prospect in the Cubs minor league system for his first start. Like we said, and boy, Ben Brown did not disappoint. He actually had a little help from his defense as opposed to the night before. Brown yeah. gave up a leadoff double to Xandar Bogarts, but then Fernando Tatis hit a fly ball to Cody Bellinger. Bogarts tagged up and was thrown out at third on the old eight to five double play. Great throw by Belly. <laughs> nice catch by Morell, you know, to, to see through the runner. Yes, that was something that you were worried about. I'll be honest, at least I was when the ball was coming his way. Yep. And then in the fourth, Fernando Tatis hit a rope to lead off the inning that Nico sl snagged by climbing the ladder. The kids got hops. Brown went 4.2 innings pitch, gave up three hits. Machado had a double and single against Brown, and Bogarts hit a double, one walk, five case. That's, again, with a lot of these young guys, whether you're talking about Quas, Little, uh, you know, uh, Brown, it's just the walks. You, uh, Jordan Wicks, one walk, five Ks, no problem there. Unfortunately, Dustin, he finished one out away from qualifying for the win. Council pulled him with 77 pitches, um, but that was just such a great outing for, for Ben Brown. Yeah, way to make your uh, big league debut as a starter. Really nice outing. And, uh, you know, he was talking about after the game about how nice it was to see the, all the hard work he's had over the years finally pay off. Uh, MLB Tonight was talking about him. Here's what Pedro Martinez had to say about Ben Brown. But, but by watching Ben Brown today, I think they have something special in this kid. And Yeah, not, not bad when Pedro Martinez is giving you the props. Something special. All right. We'll see what happened. On offense, the Cubs' runs all came in the fifth inning. Jan Gomes uh, led off the inning with his first home run of the season, and the Cubs were up 1-0. Musgrove walked Hap, gave up a single to say, and hit Bellinger to load the bases. His night is done. And in came Stephen Kolek, and Christopher Morell rudely greeted him with a 431-foot upper deck. <laughs> And the Cubs were up five to one. And that's how this one's going to end. Sayo was three for five. Morel two for three with the grand slam. Gomes two for four with the home run. And the bullpen tips again. Miley looking really good. He went 1.1. He gave up one hit and one run, a solo home run to Igwe Rosario. And he had two Ks. Almonte pitched one inning with two Ks. Leiter pitched one inning with a walk and a K. 
And after blowing the save the night before, Alzali had a nice one, two, three inning. Good to see Alzali get right back in there. I thought that was a good move to get him back out there, even though it was a uh, non-save situation for, for him. So good. Uh, that was good. And Hey, listen, that that's the difference. I, I think last year, um, Ben Brown probably doesn't get that start. I think David Ross pushes back on that idea. Drew Smiley probably starts that game last year, and the Cubs lose that game last year. So that was a that was a big win, even though it's still obviously very early in the season. So and now it's nice bounce back. We get to game three, and the Cubs have a chance to uh, win the series. Kyle Hendricks is on the mound facing a former Cubs prospect. We hardly knew him, and then he was the ace of the White Sox for a little bit, Dylan Cease. Yeah, Dustin. See, that, again, this is where the Monday night kills you because you and I both knew on paper this just looked awful. Like, right. you know, my, made my stomach turn when I saw this. Uh, and, and it went exactly as we predicted. Uh, Hendricks gets rocked, ceases dealing. For Kyle, it started out with some bad luck. Now, I know people don't want to hear this, but as the game went on, it wasn't about luck. The Padres were hitting him like a piñata. So, you know, you look at the first time through the lineup, the second time through the lineup, the third time in the lineup – um, you know, again, some of it does involve a little bit of luck. Other, others of it was not luck. It was, it was purely hitting them, but this is what I kind of mean on luck here. If you take a look, this was the second inning when the, uh, Padre scored two runs. If you're looking, if you're watching this on the fly, the W podcast on uh 670, the scores YouTube channel, the very, uh, with one out in the second, the Padres hit three straight singles that all had an exit velocity of less than 70 miles per hour. Duck snorts, finding holes, just bad luck. You know, normally when you hit a ball that week, it's not going to, you know, you're not going to get all these base hits, but they all were three straight singles, less than 70 miles per hour on the exit velocity. That led to a run. And then ha Kim stole third. Jackson Merrill uh, hit into a force out to make it 2 nothing, but his force out was only 70 miles per hour, so it was too slow to make a play on that. So just bad luck for Kyle there. But the Cubs were able to tie it up in the fourth. Now, Dylan Cease is cruising. He's got a no-hitter going. And Christopher Morrell reached on an error with two outs. And then, Dustin, how about Michael Bush blasting one to right center and the game is tied? That was awesome. Yeah, he crushed that ball. And I really thought that the Cubs had a chance to get back in that game right then and there. I thought that was kind of a momentum thing, gives everybody a spark in the dugout. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not what happened. Right. The Cubs needed Hendricks to come back with a shut with that shutdown inning, but it didn't happen. And this inning, Dustin, had nothing to do with bad luck when we talk about the fourth here. When you look at the fourth inning here, you could kind of see what happened. On, on the balls that they made contact with, they were all just hard hit. Machado had a single at, at 91 MPH. Profar doubled to score Machado to make it three to two. And Hassan Kim tripled to put the Padres up four to two, but in that inning, you're talking about on that single, it was 91 miles per hour on the, on the double by pro far exit velocity of 102. Same with Hassan Kim's triple. So they were not cheap little flares. They were hitting the ball hard. They were hitting it hard. No doubt about it. It was just, uh, uh, you know, the game really got away from the Cubs bullpen. And, and there was some talk today on the score with Bruce Levine, wondering if uh, maybe Craig council left uh, Kyle Hendricks in there a little too long. Uh, that's the question we're going to talk, you know, here's the thing. Hendricks was able to get out of the, uh, you know, was able to get a one, two, three in the inning in the fifth. Okay. And so, you know, you're going to have to roll the dice sometimes. And that's what he tried well, to I'm do. Saying, like that, that's what yeah. we're talking about. Like maybe, right. maybe if you pull him in the fifth, you know, but again, when you score two runs, you're not going to win a whole lot of baseball games. Yeah. You know, he comes out for that six inning, trying to squeeze one out and, and, and Cronenworth let off with a Homer Machado single Profar hit the second home run of the inning. That's it for Hendricks. Dustin, five innings, seven runs on nine hits, no walks, two Ks, two home runs in the six. Dustin, for the first time in his career, Kyle has given up at least five runs in three consecutive appearances. The bullpen looked like trash anyway. Daniel Palencia pitched two innings, gave up two runs on two hits, three walks, and three Ks. Yeah, yeah the walks, the walks, the walks. That's what you get with these young pitchers. And then Jose Quaz went one inning, gave up one run on one hit and a walk with two Ks and a hit by batter. So you're just giving up these free bases. The Cubs offense against Cease and the Padres bullpen was non-existent. Cease gave up two runs on two hits, but both of those runs were unearned because of the error on Hassan Kim. The defense only had three hits and they walked three times. The Michael Bush homer was the only run that the Cubs scored. But Dustin, the big picture of this series and, and of the season so far, and you were kind of alluding it to there, well, should he, you know, did he try pushing his luck? 
Here's the problem that, that credit council faces right now, and they're related. One is the fact that the starters are not going deep, and two is underperformance in the pen, sprinkle in some injuries, and that's why the Cubs lost this, this series, right? You got the injury to tie on before the season starts. You lose Steele on opening night and have to go to the bullpen right away. And then they had to pitch a lot the entire weekend in Texas. Hendricks got pounded and Wicks didn't go deep. Then when you go right, to – So they've already, they've already taxed that bullpen. There's no doubt about that. Right. Shota and Assad went six innings in the first two games of the homestand against Colorado. But since that Assad start against Colorado, there hasn't been a starter that has recorded more than 15 outs. So – Showed his second start against the Dodgers was cut short by rain. You got a long, you got a lot of young guys in the rotation like Assad, Ben Brown, Jordan Wicks. That, that you know they're not they're not able to go as deep as you'd like. Dustin, you look at the numbers right now. The Cubs have had you know starters. Their starters have thrown 52.2 innings, while their relievers have thrown 53. So the relievers have thrown more than the starters, right? And so that's the problem that you have right there. And that's why you push a guy like, uh, you know, Kyle Hendricks. Can I get one more inning? Because you're trying to to save the bullpen a little bit. And, and that bullpen, you know, your big free agent signing in the pen, Hector Neris, he's pitched four games. He has an ERA of 736. Jose Quas has pitched five games. He has an ERA of nine. Palencia. ERA of 540. Palencia is only up there because of an injury to Julian Merriweather, and we're going to talk about that in segment three, but that that's a huge blow. And then Albert Alzali has two blown saves and six appearances. Would have been a third if Michael Bush didn't make a spectacular defensive dive in the third game against the Dodgers to save that game. So you, you're, you're in this problem right now where you need length out of your starters. You don't get it. You tax the bullpen. Quas and Neris have got to step up. Alzali has got to get more locked in. And Dustin, it's going to be interesting to see what decisions are going to be made when Jamison Tyone is ready to start the big leagues. I'm looking at it right now. I think Javier Assad's look great. We're going to see what Ben Brown has. I don't know. You know, I don't want to go too crazy off the first start. And then he had a good performance when he kind of came in off of the Luke Little opener. But but you know, they're going to have to make a decision when um Tyone is ready to come off. And it looks like it's going to be sooner rather than later. You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It is season three. It's episode 30. The Cubs let that series slip away in San Diego. Don't forget to listen, download, review, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. In this segment, Crowley's talking to our guy, Alex Cohen, broadcaster for the Iowa Cubs about the season's team that's loaded with prospects and which players may be coming sooner rather than later to help out the big league club up at Clark and Addison. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, glad to have our old friend Alex Cohen back. Alex, the Illinois bro or the National Broadcaster of the Year last year, correct? That's right, uh, Ballpark Digest, 2023. So I guess all my uh, my Venmos went to the right places. So love it, love it, love it. So Alex, obviously, I always love talking Iowa Cubs with you, but. I would say this week it really is more important than ever because there's just so much going on as far as injuries and other things yeah. that the movement between the Iowa Cubs and Chicago Cubs, it's always a lot, but I have a feeling it's going to be even bigger this year. Yeah, I mean, the I-80 shuffle is real. Uh, again, I, I said it on one of the marquee broadcasts. It was three turns from Wrigley Field to Principal Park. And I think a lot of people are going to be using that. Uh, obviously, Daniel Palencia and Ben Brown are the first two players who have gone up from Iowa to Chicago. And, you know, Daniel Palencia gets the save in his first outing back. And Ben Brown just spun, you know, four and two-thirds scoreless at Petco Park, first big league start uh, against the likes of Fernando Tatis Jr. and Manny Machado. So I think it's been a good start so far. Now you got to see Ben Brown last year when he was called up. What did you notice in his start last night, if you had a chance to watch it or today at all, or or what is it about Ben Brown that get, should get Cub fans excited? Well, I, I think what I saw last night was improved fastball location. Yeah, the ability to throw 95, 98, and put it wherever that he wanted. Uh, obviously, at the AAA level, we saw a lot of spurts of Ben striking at 10, 11, 12 guys in an outing. And the fastball location was great there, but then, you know, when he did get hit around, it was because of fastball location. I think last night he did a tremendous job. I mean, even going into the fifth inning, you know, 95 to 97 and dotting it wherever he wanted to. Uh, and, and then just the the knuckle curve. Um, you know, that curveball is a 70-grade pitch. I think it's shown why it was a 70-grade pitch. And I think since he's been in the big leagues, it's initiated, you know, the most swings and misses out of any pitch for him. So, 
uh, just you know, being able to have that two pitch mix, you know, fastball 95 to 98, and then that curveball, uh, being able to get the weak contact. And outside of his first outing, he's been dominant. So, and really just doing it on two pitches has been really impressive. Yeah, and so as as we kind of look at this right here, I mean, you should go to Principal Park just because it's awesome and such a fun time, and you're there. But this team, oh my God, Alex, this team is stacked. I mean, they really this, are. You, I mean, yeah. I mean, you've been there a really while. Stacked. Is this the best team you've yeah. ever seen so far? On paper, yeah. I mean, <laughs> unequivocally. Uh, I mean, it's been ten games in, and you know, this team is six and four right now. They're averaging five point six runs per game. And they've underachieved. I mean, they've had certain games where they really didn't get the, the bat swinging until the eighth inning. So they have back-to-back games where they scored nine runs each. You know, first game in St. Paul, nine runs, 13 hits, four homers. I mean, obviously Patrick Wisdom helped that. But, you know, Matt Mervis, you know, OPS over 1,000. Luis Vasquez just added to the 40-man roster. He had two home runs on Tuesday. And then you have all Owen Casey and Pete Crow Armstrong. So top to bottom, this is the best Iowa Cubs lineup I've ever seen. It's not even a it's not even a close second. So. so when I take a look at this right here, and you're looking, like you said, if we just look at the outfield, I mean, Owen Casey, Alexander Canario, Pete Crow Armstrong, and then Brennan Davis will be back. And, and then you also have, yeah. D, you know, David Peralta will be there soon. Um, but when you're looking at PCA first, let me just ask, how's he feeling? I know he kind of, uh, you know, was they were just being careful. He had a dive the yeah. other day and the arm was a little bit off. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a trainer, but um, I would be very shocked not to see Pete Crow Armstrong um, in a lineup sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours. So um, I, I think it's just a day-to-day thing. And, you know, he could be in the lineup as early as today. I mean, he was out taking batting practice yesterday. He was shagging fly balls. He was scaling outfield walls. So I think that that shows that he's pretty healthy. Um, and, and since he's been here, all he's done is steal four bags, two triples, uh, leadoff home run on his first pitch at Principal Park. Uh, a couple doubles and just electrifying on the base pass and a couple web gems as well. So um, I think he really took that stand up with the big leagues and he goes over 14 and he doesn't get a hit. And instead of taking that him down, um, it's only motivated him more um, and him coming here, boundless energy. Um, he's played pretty well. I mean, the OPS is right around 900. Again, four stolen bases, two triples. Um, he's one of the most electrifying players I've ever seen on a baseball field. And that's just continued. Now, I would say for most people, the breakout star of spring training, if we can even make that up, I'm making that up right now. Yeah. But the breakout star of spring training, you you saw it, I saw it. Oh, and Casey. I mean, it just, like I said, to me, it, it started with the World Baseball Classic. It continued in Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, they got another mm-hmm. ring. You know, Owen Casey's collecting them. And then and then now, you know, in, in spring training, I mean, he really opened some eyes. And now continuing in Iowa. What are you yeah. seeing from OK, Owen Casey? He's 21 years old. He's the youngest player on this team, and all he's done is hit 300 in his first 10 games with four doubles. Um, you know, his first series, he had three straight multi-hit games. Uh, he set the bar very high, and he's going to go through growing pains. I mean, the strikeout rate is still high, and it's probably going to be high up until June or July. And he, he's by far the youngest player on this team. He's one of the youngest players in the league when you take out you know Jackson Holiday now going up to the big leagues, and um, he's pretty special. And I think the hitting's really special. I think the temperament's really special. And he's a really underrated athlete. That dude can fly. You know, left side of the batter's box, he's 6'3", long strides. He can play in the outfield. He has a strong arm. He legitimately has five tools. Um, And I think that that's going to show at the AAA level and hopefully when he gets up to the big leagues. When I look at the infield, and you mentioned Luis Vasquez, would you say Luis is probably the most underrated prospect in the system? By far. I've had people saying since he was 19 years old that he could play at the big leagues right now defensively at three different positions, at third, at short, and at second. He is a gold glove caliber shortstop. And, you know, he had 20 home runs last year, which was 12 more than he did at any point in his career. And you you hope that he can just continue that. Well, all he did yesterday was go three for three with two homers and an exit below that averaged 107 miles per hour. He's 6'2", he's well-built, he's a great kid, um, and he's just getting better and better. I mean, he's somebody that John Maley last year when he was with the Iowa Cubs, not with the Chicago Cubs, but but John said they need to put him on the 40-man and he's going to be a big leaguer. They put him on the 40-man and now he's probably going to be a big leaguer. Uh, that, and, and like I said, he's not a name that's, that a lot of Cub fans are familiar with, but, but I think they're going to know him soon enough. 
And then yeah. the other thing, Alex, is that, you know, I think last year there was the big Matt Merton, everyone, or Matt Mervis, everyone's freaking out. And then all of a sudden, you know, people don't understand how hard it is in the big leagues that, you know, most guys that go up are going to have their struggles like PCA, yeah. like Matt Mervis and come back down. But Matt Mervis is starting the year on a tear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had four hits on Tuesday and uh, he's hit well over his career here at uh, CHS Field because we're in St. Paul right now. But, you know, Merv is still, you know, nearly as many walks as he does strikeouts. He's leading the team in doubles. He had a 400-foot home run yesterday. Um, and, and I think that Matt just having a calm offseason. Now, if you look at the 2023 offseason, yeah, it comes off Cubs Minor League Player of the Year. One of the best players in all of Minor League Baseball. Goes play in the Fall League. That has an early spring because he had to go play for Team Israel in the World Baseball Classic. So just being able to get back into his normal offseason routine, going to spring training, hitting 300 in Cactus League play – and while the, the Cubs do get Michael Bush, and Michael Bush is ahead of him, and Gary Cooper is ahead of him, um, I think Matt Mervis is looking closer to 2022 Matt Mervis now than he did 2023 Matt Mervis. And 2023 Matt Mervis got on base at a 40% clip at the AAA level and at 25 home runs in total. So if you can get somewhere in between the 2022 version and the 2023 version, which we have right now, uh, sky's the limit. I mean, whether he's playing in the big leagues for the Cubs or for another team. Now, when I'm looking here, obviously, I think, you know, barring injury, a lot of, you know, a lot of the Cubs positions are pretty solidified, but it's going to be pitching yeah. that, that, that the Cubs are going to be dipping down with, with Iowa, like you already mentioned, Daniel Palencia up, Ben Brown up. And so when it comes, especially to relief pitchers, I mean, there's going to be a lot of shuffling you, you imagine right now. Yeah. And, and, and the guys that I'm kind of looking at, there's some guys with major league experience. You talk about Hayden Wisniewski, Keegan Thompson, uh, you know, and, and obviously Carl Edwards just kind of getting his, uh, his feet wet a little bit there. He was yeah. playing the other day. Um, when you look yeah, at those uh, guys right there, what are you seeing? Yeah. I mean, with Hayden, he's being stretched out as a starter and a long man. So his first outing, he was great. Um, his second outing, he gave up three runs in the first and then had a scoreless second, scoreless third and got the first two out in the fourth. So he's really just had one bad inning. And aside from that, he's been dominant. Uh, Carl Edwards Jr. had his first appearance yesterday. Yeah, remember, he hasn't pitched in a competitive game in three weeks. So walk three, two-thirds of an inning, but the Vila was there, you know, 93-94, good curveball. Um, and then Keegan Thompson had a rough first outing, but since then he's been nearly unhittable. Three appearances. He had a perfect uh, four up, four down in yesterday's game, but his last three appearances he hasn't given up a run. So so those three guys are, are really the ones that, that stick out. You know, the, you know, Wisniewski and Keegan are on the 40-man roster. You know, Carl won a World Series ring with the team. Um, and then you have another arm in Sam McWilliams, um, who started yesterday is getting a little stretched out, but I mean, you're seeing 98, 98.4, you know, fastball velocity, lots of strikeouts, averaging about 16 strikeouts per nine innings. Um, and then the secondary stuff, he throws a hard slider at 88 curveball at 85, even can mix in a changeup. I mean, he's got that, that arsenal, that stuff that, that I think he ultimately gets up to the big leagues for the first time this year. And hopefully with the Cubs. And, and and this is a feel-good story because uh, I know this guy, he's been on the podcast, he's been to Club 400, Cole Franklin. I mean, what a great story that that he gets the call up because th this kid's put in, put in the work, you know what I mean? They all have, but I just, as far as Cole, to, to get that reward and, you know, to be playing at AAA, it's going to be fun to watch how he does at this next level. He had a great start in Tennessee to start off the season when he threw four scoreless and then he gets called up to the AAA level. And, and I don't think people realize like how big Cole Franklin was of a prospect when he broke into the system. I mean, he's one of the most talented arms that the Cubs have had really over the last five years in terms of stuff and projection and, you know, had a little bit of a sidetrack, injury issues, control issues. Then he gets to the double-A level, starts to really pitch well. Um, and now coming up to the triple-A level, in what capacity is he going to pitch? Is he going to be a long reliever? Can, are they going to try to maximize his stuff in a one to two inning stretch where he can go up and bump it up to 97 to 99? Is he going to start here? So uh, I think the opportunities are, are endless for Cole Franklin because he is very versatile. He is very well liked, as you said, um, and he's one of the most talented arms in the system. Really looking forward to seeing how he debuts in AAA. Now, a guy that we've been watching for a little bit, Cam Sanders. Um, you know, I was hoping last year be the breakout year, and, and you know, he was not called up. Um, what, what do we see for Cam? What needs to happen for him to take that final step to get into the major leagues? 
Yeah, he's got to throw strikes. Um, I, I think it's pretty simple with Cam because if you looked at the stats last year, um, he had nearly 100 strikeouts as a reliever. I mean, he was averaging about 15 <laughs> strikeouts per nine innings, but then you, you walk a batter an inning. And, and if you are a reliever at the AAA level with a track record of throwing balls and walking guys, you're not going up to the big leagues. You're not going to pitch in the big leagues. And I think that's something that he's really worked on during the offseason. He did really well in spring training. And he has four appearances here with the I-Cubs this year. Um, and only one out in control has been an issue. So when you have three out of four outings that are really good, you're trending in the right direction. So I think it's just throwing strikes, showing a precedent that he throws strikes, and the fact that you can get up to 95, 97 with a devastating slider. Keep on throwing that. You'll probably be able to move up. Now, when is the next time you are going to be appearing on Marquee for a broadcast with the iCubs? Because I love it to see you guys out there. I get to hear my Salsa King read. Uh, I love you and Ryan Sweeney. You and Ryan Sweeney make a heck of a team. I was, you know, listening to you guys in spring. It was a lot of fun. When's the next time I get to see Alex's smiling face on the Marquee Network? Yeah, it'll be next Thursday at uh, at Principal Park. Um, you know, fortunately for us, we have 17 games on Marquee Sports Network this year. We've already had two, but we have 15 more. Um, yeah, so we have one uh, next Thursday, and then the first. Two weeks in May, we are home. We have a pair of six-game series. So I think you'll see us uh, a couple times during that homestand as well. So you'll see a lot of the Iowa Cubs. Uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of the Cubs minor league affiliates because you have Road to Wrigley of over 40 total you know, standalone minor league broadcasts for the second-best farm system in all baseball. So it's pretty special. Now, the other thing is, 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 you know, we've been down to Principal Park. We always have fun every time we go there. You know, I always tell people, hey, man, you got to get to Principal Park. You got to get to the bait shop. You got to go to all the, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a fun place to hang out. Yeah. But you guys got a ton of promotions coming up as well. And, and, and that, that's a lot of fun for people that have never been out to uh, Principal Park. And the one that yeah. you guys got coming up that I always kind of like, you know, a lot of people kind of like is the Iowa caucuses on Tuesday, right. April 30th. Tell our listeners what the Iowa caucuses are all about. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it kind of took on a life of its own. So it started in 2019 when, you know, the caucus was taking all the media, you know, by storm when it came to the 2020 presidential election. And since I was the first caucus state, they have these specialty jerseys that are red, white and blue and say caucus is out in front instead of the Cubs. So it, it's really just a, a jersey, an alternate identity. There's no real promotion that goes behind it. But the jerseys are sick. They're awesome. Uh, very patriotic. And when you can put together, you know, our our nation's colors and baseball, it's just it's a great combination. So uh, where were the Iowa caucuses when we come back? Uh, we have a lot of great promotions. We have Star Wars night, Star Wars jerseys. We have a sensory night. Um, which is actually really special in July or should be in June. Um, we have the Savannah Bananas coming to Principal Park. We have the Iowa Hawkeyes coming to Principal Park. Uh, we're working on stuff with a lot of the collectives for uh, NCAA with you know Iowa, Drake, and Iowa State. And you know, obviously Iowa had such a run in the NCAA tournament women's wise and and the men's program was you know top 10 in the country. So um, it's gonna be an, an inclusive, thorough promotional schedule for the Iowa Cubs this year. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And don't forget the Demonios, which I always love to. It's, I'm a Jersey guy, right. so like Sunday, May 5th at 108, it's the Copa, it's it's the uh, the Demonios de Des Moines, which which right. is really cool. I really like I said, I love all of that stuff. It, it's going to be a lot of fun. Alex, we talked about a lot of different players. Is there somebody that you think, hey, you know what, this guy's not getting a lot of love? This is a guy that maybe we didn't mention that 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 may kind of uh, impress some people if they head to Iowa or watch on Marquee. Yeah, I'll give you one infielder um, and then one outfielder. So I'm going to go with Chase Strump, you know, a guy who was a high-round draft pick out of UCLA 2019. And, you know, if you look at the overall body of work, it's not a particularly high batting average, but he's put a lot of work into that. But the power's there. The walks are there. Defensive versatility is there. I mean, he's a guy that if you extrapolate all of his numbers to 162 games at the AAA level, he's – on pace for over 30 homers and he's on pace for over hundred runs batted in and he's on pace for a 360 on base percentage. So if you can hit for power, you could drive in runs and you can get on base, you're going to be you know, worthy of getting a call up or you know, in conversation for a call up. So um, I think as long as Chase continues that, he went three for three on Sunday with a homer, a double, a walk and a single drove in three. Um, I think that he can make a difference at the big league level. Um, I, I think that his comp, is probably Patrick Wisdom with a little bit more walks. Patrick might be a little bit better defensively, but as a hitter, it's Wisdom, same power, more walks. Um, and then 
you know, from an outfielder's perspective, if you talk to me in a week, hopefully he gets back and healthy. Not enough people are talking about Brendan Davis. Not enough people are talking about the spring that he had, how he came back in camp. And he was really the talk of camp over the first two weeks. You know, this is a guy who's still a year and a half younger than the average AAA player age. It's only 24. So if he can come back and he's healthy and he can get into a rhythm from a potential standpoint, now you have another starting outfielder. So um, I don't think enough people have talked about Brendan Davis. I think people have really given up on him too soon. Um, and, and then Chase Trump is a high round draft pick, you know, infielder who can play second and third with power. So those are the two guys you know, that stick out to me. Well, Alex, when you bring up Brendan Davis, the thing I always think about it is that people did the same exact thing with Miguel Amaya, where again, yep. futures MVP, futures game MVP, a guy that had, you know, top uh, number one prospect ran into some injury problems and then everyone just kind of wrote him off. And now here he Game is right now. Here he is getting a lot of time in the, in the big leagues. And so these guys have talent. It just, it, you know, sometimes they're again, progress in the minor leagues, Alex, as you know, is not linear. Now, no. Alex, where mm -hmm. can our listeners find you on social media? Cause your content is just fantastic. And I know that Appreciate there's a little number at the end of it that people have to be aware of. Yeah. It is at Voice of Cohen 2. So at Voice of Cohen 2, there was an original Voice of Cohen account. It got hacked. Actually, when I was here in St. Paul last year, you know, I tried to get the account back. I couldn't. My direct messages to Elon have gone unanswered. So the <laughs> at Voice of Cohen account is retired. And at Voice of Cohen 2 is all alive and well. Um, you can also check us out at, at Iowa Cubs. Uh, stream live. You can stream live on the Valley Live app. See a lot of our stuff on Marquee Sports Network. Um, and then on our social media channels at Iowa Cubs on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, you guys always do a phenomenal job, and I love coming out to Principal Park. Like I said, the people, the experience, it's always such a good time, Alex. I, I'm, I'm glad you were able to hop on today because, like I said, I got a feeling that there's going to be a lot of Cubs-Iowa synergy going on this season, and and you and I are going to be talking in the future as well. <laughs> right. That's right. No, we, uh, we're looking forward to having those discussions, and you know you're always more than welcome at Principal Park, Crawley, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you throw out a first pitch. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Take care, bud. <laughs> Thanks, bud. All right, episode 30 of season three, the Fly the W670 podcast. Cubs let the series slip away in San Diego. Don't forget to leave Crowley and I one of those five-star reviews. All right, Crowley, let's uh, look at the standings, see uh, if the Pirates are still on top and the Cardinals are still on the bottom. Yes, they are, so the, at least half of this makes me very happy. All right, Pirates are at nine and three, Brewers eight and three, the Cubs are at seven and five, Cincinnati at six and six, and no tears for the Cardinals whenever they're in last place, but they're at six and seven. So, you know, obviously Milwaukee and Pittsburgh have kind of shot out of the gate. The Cubs aren't that far behind, and, and, and you know, the division's pretty bunched up pretty early on. So, you know, and lot, the, Reds are, the Reds are probably going to come to Chicago and feast on the White Sox this weekend. Right. Love that. Um, that's God, that's a bad team over on the South side, but, uh, we got some bad news on the uh, injury report here, Julian Merriweather, you know, they thought it was a right shoulder issue, but imaging revealed a rib stress fracture, which I think, wasn't that the same thing that happened to Stroman last year? I'm not sure. I don't know if that was that bad, but it, it sounds super painful. That's what it right. sounds like. Now, Hoyer said, candidly, we'd be hoping it'd be a shorter stint on the IL. It's a little worse diagnosis than we had imagined, and we just have to get through it. The Cubs have him on the 15-day IL, but Dustin, to me, I got a feeling that's going to be changed. I think he's going to be moved over to the 60-day IL. Oof, I hope not. I hope you're wrong about that, but it does sound like uh, it might be till the All-Star game since we uh... – Till we get another another look at him. All right, how about Jamison Tyon? What's up with his uh, rehab starts? Yeah, you know, we he, he started last time we talked, he started for the Smokies. Well, the Cubs have set a second rehab date, Friday, April 12th. He will be pitching for the Iowa Cubs. So we, we kind of wondered about that last episode. They are going to move him up to pitch against Iowa and, and maybe against a little bit tougher competition. All right, I guess that makes sense. And Patrick Wisdom has been doing some work as well. Yep, he's continuing his rehab stint with the I-Cubs going two for four with a double, a homer, and three RBIs. And then on Wednesday, he went one for four with a three-run blast. So looks like uh, P-Wiz is finding his swing all right. 
it'll be interesting to see what they do in a corresponding move when you get guys like Tyone and uh, Wisdom back and ready to go. All right, Crowley, this weekend the Cubs are going to be playing out in Seattle, taking on the Mariners, get the coffee brewing because Friday and Saturday are pretty late night starts. Yeah, and don't forget that on Friday it's going to be that Apple TV start. It's not on marquee, so just kind of be aware of that. But seventy uh, the score, Pat and Ron, the Hall of Famer and the All Star. Let's do it. But when you take a look at the Cubs in Seattle, they had really similar frustrating ends to the twenty twenty three season. Remember last year, the Cubs had a high chance of making the postseason in September. The Mariners had a 90.2% chance of making the postseason on September 2nd and were in first place in the AL West. And just like the Cubs, the Mariners collapsed in September. In fact, both teams, the Cubs and the Mariners, had the exact same record in September, 12 and 17, and both missed the final wild card spot by one game. Uh, you know that uh, it was Houston that got first, Texas second. They went on to win the World Series, and the Mariners won the outside looking in. The Cubs and Mariners played each other once last season at Wrigley Field with the Cubs taking two out of three in versus Seattle. In game two, the Cubs had a 2-1 lead in the ninth, but Michael Fulmer blew the save, giving up the home run to Jared Kelnick. But in the bottom of the 10th, Nico Horner had his first career walk-off hit, if you remember that at Wrigley Field. Yeah, pretty cool moment for him, no doubt about that. Now in the offseason, you know, you think about this. After falling one game short of the postseason and having one of the best young pitching staffs, you think the Mariners would make some moves, but they didn't. Their payroll in 2024 is only $1.5 million higher than in 2023. And Dustin, you know how quick these windows can close. I'm sure Seattle fans are just, you can't be in the same division with Houston and Texas and, and just stand pat. Just yeah. not a smart move. Um, they yeah. added catcher and DH Mitch Garver, second baseman Jorge Polanco, relief pitcher Ryan Stanek, who's an interesting guy. I know the Cubs were interested in him in the offseason. It didn't happen. And then some losses, uh, Teoscar Hernandez, we just saw in the Dodgers series, catcher Tom Murphy, and relief pitcher Dominic Leon. But Seattle, Dustin, has yet to win a series this season. They split the first season with Boston, one of my favorite four-game series. Then they lost a series to Cleveland, Milwaukee, and just yesterday they avoided the sweep against the Blue Jays by winning the finale 6-1. to one. But the team's top three hitters, J.P. Crawford, Julio Rodriguez, Jorge Polanco are all struggling. They're all hitting below 200, Dustin. And the team has the sixth lowest batting average in baseball, the second most strikeouts, and the fourth lowest OPS. Well, I'm guessing that uh, a couple of those guys might be on the uh, not list for the hot and not part, but we'll get to that in a minute. All right, pitching probables Friday night is going to be Jordan Wicks getting the ball. Yeah, game one, Jordan Wicks versus righty Bryce Miller. Jordan's 0-1 with a 4.15 ERA. This is Jordan's third start of the season. Uh, this is what we talk about with length, though. He only went four innings against Texas, gave up five runs on five hits, but only two of the runs were earned. He walked three and struck out six, so there's those walks. Against the Dodgers, he had a much better start. He went 4.2 innings, gave up two runs on six hits, one walk and seven Ks. So he limited the walks that uh, against the Dodgers, so that was good. He's going to go up against 25-year-old righty Bryce Miller. He's 1-1 one one with a 3 ERA. In his first game against Boston, he went five innings pitch, gave up four runs on six hit, two homers, two walks, and six Ks. But in his last start against Milwaukee, he pitched a gem. Seven innings pitch, he gave up no run on three hits, one walk, and seven Ks. Bryce will mainly throw a four seamer and split finger with an occasional sinker and slider. The thing you got is you know, the Cubs are going to be facing two of these very good. Seattle has a really good young pitching staff, and the Cubs are going to face two of these guys. So we'll see what happens. Then we've got Shota Imanaga making his first uh, road start in game number two. Yep, Shota Imanaga versus Emerson Hancock. Uh, Imanaga, I want to know, with an ERA of zero, he is the NL pitching war leader right now. In his first game against the Rockies, six innings pitch, gave up two hits, nine Ks, and no walks. In a rain-shortened second outing, he went four innings pitch and gave up two hits and three Ks, but that just killed the bullpen, Dustin, because he was cruising, and then you got to pull him out, and the bullpen had to go the rest of the way with that uh, rain delay. Now, Emerson Hancock is a 24-year-old righty with a 1-1 one one record, 11.42 ERA. In his first start against the Guardians, he went 5.1 innings, gave up four hits, three runs, two hit by pitch, one walk, and one K. But in his second start, he got rocked by the Brewers. He only went 3.1 innings, gave up eight runs on 11 hits with one walk and six Ks. He throws a four-seamer slider changeup and sinker. 
So he's and got then, an arsenal of pitches. None of them yeah. are great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. Again, this is what you, you know, you're going to deal with these learning pains from young pitchers. We're going to see it with the Cubs. I know everyone thinks that Ben Brown is going to be the second coming of, uh, you know, Nolan Ryan or whatever, but they're going to have their ups and they're going to have their downs. And that's the thing you're going to have to watch, you know. Um, now, in game three, you got Javier Assad versus Luis Castillo. Uh, Javier, I said, has pitched well, you know, for, for Tyone while he's been out. He's 1-0 with a 164 and two games started. In the first game against Colorado, he went six innings, pitch, gave up no runs on four hits, one walk, and five Ks. In his second start against the Padres, he went five innings, pitch, gave up two runs on three hits, three walks, and seven Ks. Two of the three hits and both, and the home run came in the sixth inning on the Cubs bullpen meltdown against the Padres. Cup fans ought to remember Luis Castillo from his time with the Reds. He's had a bad start for the Mariners. He is 0-3 with a 689 ERA. Luis has given up four runs in each of his three starts. Uh, he went five innings in the first and third start and 5.2 innings in his second start. Uh, Pat and Ron were talking about this on the broadcast yesterday. You know, with Luis Castillo, he's, you know, a workhorse, if anything, but he has just hasn't found it yet. He's been giving up a lot of hits. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that continues. He still has that four-seam fastball, slider, sinker, and changeup. But, uh, you know, not, not the start that the Mariners were looking from from Castillo. No, not even close. Ready for some hot knot? I'm always ready for some hot and knot, especially, uh, you know, but the Cubs have kind of cooled down a little bit here. They're still taking a good approach. And even though, you know, some of the averages are down, they're, they're still getting on base, right? And that's 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 really what this team has been doing. Um Right now, the hottest of the hot is Jan Gomes. He's four for 11 in the last week. And then uh, Seiya Suzuki is five for his last 20 with two doubles, four walks, 11 strikeouts. So, you know, a little, little slowing down here, the offense. On the cold, Nico Horner remains cold. Dustin, he had the day off. Miles Mastroboni started on Wednesday. So that's going to give him two days of rest. He's three for 17. So still not picking it up just yet. And then Cody Bellinger, four for 23 with seven strikeouts and two K and two walks. We talked about this in the off season. Is that when, you know, how are these Boris guys going to do, you know, when they're not, when they're, you know, yeah, they're in some camp Boris, but it's not big league games. And, you know, it's a slow start out of the gate for Cody. Right. His defense has been so good. It's kind of covering that up a little bit as far as the uh, um, naysayers out there. Yeah, I mean, is that that's the thing about Cody is no matter, you know, what he hits, his defense, even when he was awful, one of the worst hitters in baseball when he was with the Dodgers the last couple seasons, uh, the defense, you know, at least made up for it somewhat. All right, so we know who's not hot for the Mariners. We had talked about that a few minutes ago, but how about hot? Who do Cub fans have to be watching out for as they uh, drink some coffee or drink whatever Friday and Saturday to stay up late with this, uh, this Mariners team? Maybe some Red Bull, but uh, Dominic Canzone's the left fielder. He's five for 13 with two home runs and three RBIs in the last seven games. Uh, so he's slug he's slashing 385, 500, 923. Look out for Ty France, four for his last 13. He's slashing 308, 308, 385. And then again, it's really, really odd to kind of see all of these guys, like we said, uh, Julio Rodriguez, Mitch Garver, Jorge Polanco, J.P. Crawford, they're all struggling right now for the uh, Mariners. They did have a big win on uh, Wednesday, but uh, all in all, the offense has been pretty poor for the Mariners. So hopefully that helps the Cubs bullpen. Hopefully that helps the Cubs starters, and you know, hopefully they can take this series. Hopefully. Now we're going to predict that they're going to take the series. I'll go first. I got the Cubs taking this series, Crowley. I like the pitching matchups. Um, this is why Craig Council is here. I like the fact the Cubs got a day off uh, to kind of put the Padres' uh, disaster yesterday in the rearview mirror. So I've got the Cubs winning uh, two out of three in this one. Um, I think uh, I think they can get the first uh, two for sure. See, I'm actually, I agree with you on the two for three, but right now I like Shota Imanagasen over Emerson Hancock. He's been, Emerson's been struggling. Shota's been on fire. And then Javier Assad has looked really good and Luis Castillo's looked really bad. So I, I have a really good feeling about games two and three. Just, I'm worried about game one. Uh, and, and so my only hope with game one is because is, is, Bryce Miller's been pitching really, really well. Um, that last start was, was really Wicks. good. That was Wicks. 
Yeah, yeah, he's pitching okay. I think he's. I wouldn't say great. I'd say he's pitching great, okay. But good enough. Yeah, good enough. We'll, we'll see. I'd like. I, I still see the Cubs winning two or three here, though. All right. Well, we agree. Two out of three. I'm sure we'll all take that. That's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow on all the socials: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can email Crowley and I, Fly the W670 gmail.com. And now you can watch us. That's right. Crowley mentioned it earlier. You can watch us by subscribing to the Six Seven the Score. YouTube channel. Crowley, enjoy the weekends. Make sure you're staying up late. Good thing is you can always hit the DVR, wake up early and catch anything we uh, you might miss. And a uh, good reminder that uh, Friday, the only local broadcast will be 670 to the score as Friday is a Apple TV game. Crowley, enjoy the games. You and I will hook up again on Sunday or Monday. Yep. Let's just shake this off. Let's sweep Seattle. Go Cubs. Hey guys, it's Crowley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!